Thank you, choir. That was awesome. Have you all been enjoying this beautiful weather? Um, anything outdoors is a wonderful thing to be able to do uh, during this kind of weather. I am not a golfer, but if you are a golfer, I understand that this would be uh, great weather. I read this week about a, a gentleman who uh, was a very serious golfer, and he and his wife went to the dentist, and he made it clear to the dentist that um, he was in a hurry. He said, you know, I have a 10 o'clock tea time. It's 9.30. I need a tooth pulled, and I can't wait for the anesthetic. You're just going to have to pull the tooth. I got two guys in the car with me. And so uh, the, the dentist, he, he was just really impressed that this guy was so brave that he, he'd have a tooth pulled without any, any anesthesia whatsoever. And he said, well, I'm going to have to see the tooth. Uh, tell me where it is. And he turned to his wife and he said, open your mouth, honey. <laughs> now, just remember, I preface this by saying I am not a golfer. So don't go talking to Melinda uh, uh, about that. Bow with me in prayer, would you? Father God, we do thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for this time of year in which we see it just seems like the earth is coming alive. And it reminds us of the resurrection. It reminds us of new hope and new life. And uh, Lord, we, uh, we thank you that that's just a picture of what you have for us. Um, in addition to that general revelation, we thank you, Lord, for the specific supernatural revelation that you have given it to us through your holy word, the Bible. And we thank you that through it we can know who your son Jesus Christ is, that we can know that there is salvation in no other name but his, and that we can know how to live as followers of yours. And so, Father, we pray that you might instruct us this day through your word that it wouldn't be my words, but it would be yours, that your Holy Spirit who authored this book would also speak to our hearts and our minds and draw us closer to yourself, Lord. And Lord, just use this time uh, to bring honor and glory to your name and to make all of us consider uh, more closely how we are to live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been going through uh, some of the one another commands. The first one that Jesus gave was during the Lord's Supper. And he said, this new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Uh, the second th that we looked at last week was prefer one another. It's really the attitude behind all of the one another's uh, showing preference uh, because uh, God has shown preference to us. And this morning we're going to look at accept one another. In Romans chapter 15, verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. I uh, want to share a little um, history uh, story. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hudson Armerding was the president of Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, from 1961 to 1982. And in those, those years of the 60s, uh, there were a lot of cultural changes that were going on. And um, as supporters from the school would come and visit uh, the college there, they didn't like some of the things that they were seeing on campus. Um, and so uh, that put him in a very difficult and challenging spot because uh, they made it clear that uh, some of these young men's hair was too long. And they had beards, and uh, they were going to be uh, withholding support for the college uh, if this kind of thing continued. And so um, the president uh, said he would address the student body in one of their regular chapel services. And so uh, a as he got up and he, uh, he looked across the, uh, the chapel there, he, uh, he saw a particular young uh, man, a student, and uh, he called him by name. And he said, stand up. And he kind of reluctantly stood up. And then he said, I want you to come up here and stand with me on this platform. 
to which the young man really reluctantly started moving forward and coming up onto the platform. And then the president addressed him, and he said, Young man, you are precisely what supporters of this school object to. You have long hair. You have a beard. And they don't believe that this should be going on here. And he said, I want you to know that the administration of the school does not feel that way. He said, I love you. I accept you. And he embraced him and said, I believe you're here because God has called you here and you're wanting to know him better through his son, Jesus Christ. The whole student body stood up spontaneously and applauded. That president boldly demonstrated what it means to accept. Um, and that was way before Duck Dynasty. So he was, he was you know, cutting edge back then. Um, but that took quite courage from him. The scripture tells us very clearly here that we're to accept one another. Just as Christ has accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Now, just like the first one another that we looked at, love one another, um, this really falls into three categories. The declaration, that is really the command, um, and then the distinction, uh, how you go about it, and then, um, I'm sorry, the design, and then the distinction, what, what comes from it. First, the declaration, accept one another. This is really based upon some biblical very important biblical values about each of us and our value in God's eyes. Every single person is alike in that we are created in the image of God. That means that there, it really doesn't matter how many degrees behind our name. It doesn't matter what kind of job we have. It doesn't matter how much money we acquire or power, or fame, or beauty, or any of those things. It means every single one of us has value because we are made in the image of God. And our value is not determined upon us, but upon God himself. And so we each have intrinsic value. And if that's not enough... I want to remind us all that we're here today and we proclaim the gospel and the gospel is very clear. Jesus Christ gave his life for all mankind. And so our value is really placed upon the blood of Jesus, the most precious of all things. And God says, that's how much I value you. And every single person is unique because God's created each of, uh, of one of us as a one of a kind. We're a piece, a masterpiece of his. Scientists tell us that snowflakes, not one snowflake is the same. Which, to me, just says, our God just loves to be creative. It's like sometimes he just likes to show off. He's so good, you know. And look around. He does that in us as well. In, in the beauty and the variety of all of humanity and all of the creative things that he's done in us. And so at the very core, um, we, we need to accept one another understanding that we have been accepted and we've been made precious in God's sight. Um, to illustrate that, I want to show a video. This is by the Skit Guys. They're, they're a great Christian kind of comedic group. Uh, these two uh, guys were friends all through school. And in this particular skit, they actually share about a young lady who was a faithful Christian who demonstrated that kind of loving acceptance to them. And 20 years later, when they're Thinking about a school reunion, they're still talking about her.
been 20 years since I graduated high school. Tonight's the big 20-year class reunion. Do I look like I've been out of high school for 20 years? Okay, never mind. I answered my own question. If I'm not mistaken, this right here, this was Mrs. Tomlinson's geometry class. And now it's a science lab. But okay, this class, I was never very good in geometry, and I'd always protest, why do I need geometry? I'll never use geometry in all my life. And she'd always smile at me and say, wait till you get older, you'll be glad you did this. And you know what? I still never use it. The real reason why I came down this hallway was to find a locker. One, two, okay, right here. This locker, this was Stacy Bell's locker. She was uh, my best friend in high school. She introduced herself to me when I was in seventh grade. She like picked me out of a crowd, it seemed like. But you know, we became friends. I mean, we shared everything together. We were supposed to bring pictures of high school memories and stuff like that. Okay, I brought a picture of uh, me and Stacy at our senior prom. Um, I know I look like Harry Potter. But if there was one person that I could see at this 20 year reunion, it'd be her. She changed my life in some ways. I'll never forget her. I'll never forget that day. I was walking down this hallway and I dropped my books, right? I mean, they went everywhere. And everyone's just walking by and, and I'm trying to pick them up and you can imagine me bending down to pick up books was a whole production. And this pretty blonde girl was standing, she was standing about right here at her locker. And all of a sudden she looks down at me trying to get the books and, and she's like, let me help you with those. And I'm like, okay, you know? She picks up my books and looks at me and she's, hi, my name is Stacy. And I'm like, hey, I'm Dennis. She's like, how about I carry these to your next class for you? And I'm like, how about you do that, you know? So Stacy carries my books to class. By the time we got there, I think that I know everything about her because she's just talking and talking. And then she sits my books on my desk and starts to walk out. And I'm thinking to myself, well, good for you. You did your good deed of the week, you know? And then she turns around. And she goes, hey, Dennis, I've got a great idea. Some of my friends and I are going roller skating tomorrow night. How about you join us? And I'm like, yeah, uh, I don't do so well on wheels. She kind of laughed and she said, it's OK. I will help you. I said, OK. So that next night, I find myself at a roller skating rink with Stacy and her friends. I don't know who was more scared, me or the guy I handed my money to and said, size nine and a half, please. And I sat on the side while Stacy and her friends were roller skating for a while, but it felt good just to be part of a group. And then Stacy skates over out of nowhere and says, Dennis, come on out and skate. And I'm like, no, no, I'm cool, I'm cool. And she's like, no, come on. I'm like, serious, huh? She goes, come on, I will help you. And I was like, okay. So Stacy helped me out on the roller skating rink. You should have seen everybody's eyes. I just looked at him and said, it's okay. I'm a professional skater. <laughs> but with Stacy's help, I made it all the way around the skating rink twice. It was so awesome. As Stacy was dropping me off at my house that night, she said, Dennis, I got another good idea. Tomorrow, my family is having a cookout and going swimming. Why don't you join us? And I was like, yeah, um, this body don't float, you know? She said, it's okay, I will help you. I said, okay. So there I was that next day, standing in the shallow end of Stacy's pool. I was like, we, you know, Stacy started laughing. She goes, Dennis, the shallow one's no fun. Come on in the deep end with me. I was like, no, no, it's okay. She goes, no, come on. I was like, no, I, I'm cool. She goes, Dennis, come on. I will, and I stopped her. And I said, I know, you will help me. But she did. She held out her arms and helped me float in the water. It was so great. After we'd finished swimming, we were eating, and she was telling me her dreams. I tell you, I really believe that girl could change the world. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she turns the tables on me. She looks at me, and she says, hey, Dennis, tell me about your dreams. And I'm like, well, I don't really have any dreams. She goes, come on, everybody's got dreams. And I was like, no, not me. 
and she just kept persisting, and I got so frustrated with her. And so finally, I looked at her, and I said, okay, you want to know my dream? I'll tell you my dream. In my dream, these old hands, they are no longer crippled. And I can pick up things and throw things, and, and it's no problem. And in my dream, my hip is right in place, and I can walk and run and jump just like everybody else. And I said, in my dream, I don't need these old glasses to see anymore. And in my dream, my mouth is normal, just like everybody else's. And I'm just like everybody else. But then I realize it's only a dream. We sat there in silence for quite a while. And then Stacy looked at me, and I'll never forget what she said. She said, Dennis, that's the dumbest dream I've ever heard. And I was like, well, you sure know how to make a cripple guy feel good. And she said, no, no, Dennis, you don't get it. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. And I looked at her, and I said, no, Stacy, you don't get it. I'm a joke. And she just shook her head at me. Dennis. God does not look as man looks. She said, sure, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart, Dennis, and you have a great heart. I like to think she was right. I hope I do have a good heart. I know she had a great heart, and that girl changed my life. You know how I said there was one person I want to see at this reunion? Stacy? She's not here. She's not coming. When I think about her, I think about Galatians 6.10. She epitomizes this. Therefore, as we have opportunities, let us do good for all people. She was just good. She found opportunities to love God and love others. I use her in the past tense because uh, Stacy. She died in a car wreck our freshman year in college. Jesus gave this visual in Matthew 10, 42, and he talks about kindness and compassion. It's almost as if you give a cup of cold water to somebody. That's what she did for me. She gave me a cup of cold water, and she pointed me toward God. She did it for me. She did it for a lot of people. She had a bumper sticker that said, My life is dedicated to saving your life. I'm part of her legacy. So much so, I'm still talking about it 20 years later. Stacy showed the acceptance of Jesus, didn't she? And uh, those two men are still impacted by her life to this day. I want to say, um, I just want to reiterate, I guess, what was said there straight from Scripture to each of you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay? So we're to accept one another. And how do we do it? We're to accept one another just as Christ accepted you. We're to accept each other as Christ accepted us. Um, how was that, he, that he accepted us? Well, in earlier in Romans uh, 5, verse 8, it tells us, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus never said to any one of us, you get your life together you get it all straightened up, get it all cleaned up, and then I will accept you, did he? He didn't. He stretched out his arms on a cross, and he bled and died for us while we were far away from him. Now, I realize I'm a preacher, and I realize when you talk about acceptance in the church, you got to be careful because people will start saying, now, 
Pastor, are you talking about just accepting all kinds of sinful things? Are you going across that line? And I'll tell you right now, I'm not going past any line that Jesus hasn't passed. And here's the fact of our Savior. And actually, I'll be honest, he makes me kind of uncomfortable sometimes. Okay? But Jesus had the reputation for eating with tax collectors and sinners, didn't he? Um, he modeled acceptance in the encounter that he had with the Samaritan woman at the well. She had three big strikes against her. First of all, a respectable Jewish rabbi would not speak to a woman in public. Sorry, ladies, but that's just the way it was. Okay? Secondly, she was a Samaritan. She wasn't a Jew. They had, they had messed up the faith. They had married outside the faith. They weren't even worshiping in the right place. And he's talking to her. And the third thing was, she came to the well in the middle of the day. Ladies came early in the morning, or they came late in the afternoon when the sun was going down. They didn't come in the heat of the day. She demonstrated by the very fact that she was at the well at that time that she wasn't even accepted by her own community. She had made a lot of mistakes in her life. And he says, will you give me some water? And that's how he starts the conversation. And she makes note of the fact right off the bat, you're a Jew and you're talking to me? And he said, if you knew who I am, you'd ask me for living water. He was making a claim on her life. He was accepting her and loving her, even in her lostness. He makes it clear as the conversation goes on, when he says, go tell your husband, um, she says, I don't have a husband. To which he responds, you're correct. You've had five, and the man you're with now is not your husband. She's gone through a lot of pain and brokenness. And he loved her. And it's clear. You read the story. I'm not going to read the, the chapter for you. You go back and read it. John chapter 4. But that woman's life has changed that day. She goes and shares with the whole town. They come. They convince Jesus to stay for two more days. And it says others come to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he showed some acceptance. Um, he did the same thing to Zacchaeus, didn't he? That little tax-collecting cheater who was robbing from his own people, and he sees him up in the tree as the crowd is all there, and he looks up at him and says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to eat in your house today. I know, we got that song that we play in our heads, don't we? But, but what did he do? Did he say, you're a lying, cheating scum that's turned on your brothers and sisters? No. By his very presence, by his very acceptance, what happens in the case of the Samaritan woman? What happens in Zacchaeus' life? Somehow the holiness of Jesus Christ was such that they repented and they turned to him. He didn't spend a lot of time beating people over the heads about their sin. He just lived a godly life and showed the love of God to them. It seemed the people that he had the most problems with were the self-righteous Pharisees, right? <laughs> Who were always measuring themselves to everybody else. And we're not called to measure ourselves with everybody else. We're called to measure ourselves with Jesus, which means if we're talking about a yardstick, I don't know, we're debating over an eighth of an inch and a sixteenth of an inch, something like that, right? That's how I feel anyway. Got a long way to go. And he accepts us. Um, 
And so with that same kind of acceptance that you receive from the Lord, you need to extend to other people. I've shared my testimony before, but I, I, I tell you, when you don't grow up in the church and you don't hear everything uh, from the get-go, I, I can remember I was convinced that Jesus was the Savior, that he gave his life on the cross for me, and suddenly I realized I was a sinner and I was going to be separated from God for eternity if I didn't give my life to Jesus Christ. And I walked down that aisle to commit my life to the Lord at the end of a service. And honestly, when I was coming down, I was sure that all those people that were sitting in the pews like you are this morning would think, he's a bad person. Because I knew I was admitting that I was a sinner and I was lost. And I can remember the first person that came up, Helen, she hugged me and she said, I remember when I committed my life to the Lord. See, I just thought church was a group of really good people. I didn't know church was a hospital for sinners. I didn't know it was about coming to God and realizing our need. I just heard the truth and I responded to it. Jesus... He came for us, and he says, with Arden to open wide, I accept you. Wonderful that he accepts us in such a way he doesn't leave us in the muck and mire of our sin, but he helps clean us up and live a better life than we ever could. But he takes us in all of our brokenness, and he mends us. And he works in and through us. And you see, with that kind of acceptance to others, then what happens? God's praised, it says, in order to bring praise to God. The Apostle Paul, the greatest missionary by far of all uh, mission work that's gone on since the beginning of the church, uh, wrote these words to Timothy. He said, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example of those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. See, remember, Paul was a Pharisee. He was all about letting everybody know that he knew more and he was closer to God than everyone else. And he comes smack dab in, in the presence of the Lord Jesus and is blinded on the Damascus Road. And what happens? He realizes his lowliness. And he doesn't approach the Gentiles from, I'm better than you, but... Look at how marvelous God's grace is in me. Look what God will do. Look what God, how he'll reach out to somebody who is determined to get rid of all who followed him. You see, I believe <laughs> that the best way for us to reach the world is to let them know that we're fallen too. <laughs> we're broken too. And we found a great physician. In this uh, time in which we've been dealing with Melinda's neck, heard a lot about different doctors. And that's what you hunt for. I want a good one. I want one that can do the right thing. Jesus is the best. He's the one that can heal us, make us whole, restore us. Jesus himself said, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. There's one thing that causes angels to dance around in heaven and have just, just a party. 
somebody turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, yesterday uh, afternoon, I'm, I'm not sure why, but I, uh, I, I was getting a little sentimental, and I pulled out a, 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 a notebook that my dad had given me. Um, it's got pictures of my mom uh, when she was little and as she was growing up and my grandparents, and, and I was just flipping through that. And, and, uh, and in that was a, a letter that I wrote to my mom and, and, and a letter that one of the ladies from the church in Ironton wrote to my mom. And I had for completely forgot that that was in there. And, uh, and I began reading it. And um, she wrote to my mom telling her how uh, I had invited her to come to a Bible study at her church. And uh, how she started coming, and she started coming to the church, and I invited her to get involved um, in, in a ministry in the church and she said she knew that she wasn't worthy and that she had a lot of things messed up in her life. And she said, in the letter, she said, I went to your son's office and, and I sat down and I knew I had to tell him all of this. And she said, I fully expected that he would say, get out of here. And she said, he, sh he, he didn't act shocked. And he showed me the love of Christ when I needed it the most. And I'm not sharing that to say anything about me. Because she wrote it to my mom saying, your legacy is going to live on with people you've touched and so on and so forth. I share that this morning not because I had it planned because it wasn't even a part of the sermon initially. But the thing that made a difference in the video and in this particular lady's life was felt accepted in spite of the brokenness. And on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, I want to say to all of you, wherever you are in your life, he couldn't love you any more than he already does. And he says, through the cross, I accept you. I invite you to come to him. Bow with me in prayer. Lord God, for any and all who need to know the acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that they would come. I pray that they would simply acknowledge their need for you, turn from their sin, and say, yes, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my all. And I trust you for eternity. And Lord God, for us, who have done that sometime in the past. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in showing your love and acceptance to all the people around us and to understand that that's our mission, to be planting those spiritual seeds of your love, your acceptance, your sacrificial giving so that we can gain, so that we can be a part. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. And help us, Lord, to be bold in sharing it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we sing the closing hymn, I just want to say one other thing um, to you as a church. Uh, Jeff Waters and I pray before each of these services, and without exception, every single Sunday, and I so appreciate this, he prays for all of you. And he prays that as 
people come in the door of this church, that they would feel the love of God, feel his presence here. And based upon this scripture this morning, I want to take that and I want to take it one step further. Because you are the church, okay? All of you are the church. And what I'm praying and what I challenge us to do and be is take that in love and acceptance and the presence of God outside this building and into the community where we are so that where we are, people will feel and sense the presence and the love of God so that they will be drawn to him. That's a charge that we all should receive. Now, let's stand and sing at Calvary. And if you want to come to Jesus, you want to rededicate your life, you want to join this church family, you come as God's prompting. But let's sing together.